Smartcast. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. You have some meetings, you know, not every day, but maybe every week or every other week. And sometimes somebody who doesn't even have expertise in the area that the guy who is explaining his problem has <laughs> comes up with an idea to, well, try something like this, you know, and they do. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It is another beautiful day here in North Carolina, and this episode is brought to you by our sponsors, Habit Stack, Ignite Management Services, and Liberty Strength. These sponsors help me bring these shows to you each and every week, so I encourage you to click on their links below and check them out. Also, I want to encourage you to join us on our growing YouTube channel. Search for Deep Leadership on YouTube for videos of all my interviews and exclusive content. Well, that is it. Today I have a special treat for you. I had a chance to sit down with Paul McEnroe, the man who led the team that invented the universal product code and the scanners that went with it. The UPC code is a big part of our everyday life, but have you ever wondered where it came from? Well, Paul joins us to talk about the leadership required to create a life-changing invention. This was a very interesting conversation that I know you'll enjoy. So are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Paul McEnroe. Paul is an award-winning engineer who developed multiple state-of-the-art technology during his long career, including more than two decades in leadership positions at IBM. Paul is best known for his primary role in developing the universal product code, UPC, the barcode used on every product in supermarkets and the retail industry, and the scanners that read them. His brand new book is called The Barcode, How a Team Created One of the World's Most Ubiquitous Technology. It tells the tale of the team who created this life-changing invention. I'm excited to have him on the show to learn how to lead a team to accomplish a seemingly impossible goal. So, Paul, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I'm honored to meet you, sir. And uh, the barcode, the UPC symbol has been like... Throughout my whole life, I mentioned, uh, as in, you know, I'm 56 years old. In high school, I was, you know, worked in the supermarket scanning. So your technology uh, has lasted, you know, 50 years, which is just amazing. And so I think, I, I think it's great to have you on the show. But it's really interesting to learn how a team, how you led, how the team did the work to do something that was that was next to impossible. So I'm excited about the uh, that, to hear that story. So you let's. Let's start a talk. Talk to us about the barcode. I mean, how has this um, this staple become? How has this become a staple of the modern electronic world? And and is it surprising to you that fifty years later it's still like the standard? Well, it, it, it is that it's fifty years later. I I, I did uh, realize that uh, once we got it selected as the uh, yeah as the international standard back uh, exactly 50 years ago this year, uh, that, uh, you know, it was going to go broad and it would go wide and it would be uh, around the world and so on. So we knew it was going to be a big thing then. But that was already four years into our development because I started this thing in 1969. Wow. Uh, Would it last 50 years? No, I, I didn't really foresee that coming. Uh, perhaps uh, you're interested. Uh, your your uh, listeners would be interested in how we got started in this thing, and that leads to a lot of the answers to the questions you asked. So I had uh, just been working in an advanced development laboratory, technically uh, in IBM for nine years, and uh, my focus had been scanning. That was just kind of luck. And uh, so uh, one day, uh, out of the blue, uh, 
two guys walked into my laboratory. Uh, one of them was uh, Jack Keeler, who later became the president of IBM. And the other one was a guy named uh, Lou Stevens, who had been the inventor, one of the inventors, one of the two inventors of the RAMAC, which was the name for the random access uh, storage disk that IBM first built, the first random access storage device in, in history. So uh, they came in. Uh, Lou, because he was my boss's boss, and uh, Jack, because he wanted to offer me a new opportunity. And the opportunity he offered me was uh, that he told me that uh, IBM's chairman uh, and CEO uh, was a guy named Frank Carey. And Frank had been concerned that IBM's growth curve could not be uh, continued uh, just by building more uh, bigger and faster mainframe computers. So uh, he wanted to go to Silicon Valley and buy some startups to get into uh, things that would increase the applications around computing. And he was told by his staff, forget it, Frank, you know, <laughs> that isn't going to work. IBM's culture, uh, you know, their stock option plan, all this and that, the uh, close. Uh, everybody will quit the next morning. That's not what they want. And uh, if the people quit, you you have nothing because the uh, patents themselves aren't worth anything. It's you need the people that know how to implement them. And so uh, he said that then they, uh, they, Frank Carey and his staff decided, OK, the next best thing is we'll find somebody in IBM that uh, we can do a pseudo startup with. And uh, they happened to pick me. I don't know all the reasons why or exactly why, but I had been. Uh, going to Stanford, I, I'd gone to the engineering school there in graduate school uh, for several years, and then I switched over to the biz school. And uh, I was in Silicon Valley, and I had developed a lot of different kinds of products in the nine years. So anyway, uh, I was asked to uh, pull together a team uh, to uh, start them in a new business, a business that would be peripheral to uh, the mainframe computers that would create more applications, more data to be manipulated by those major processors. And uh, so I uh, was fortunate to be able to pull together the first part of the team, which was just two helpers to uh, look at different industries. We looked at banking. We liked that a lot. We started to go there, but it turned out we found there's another organization back in the back in the, the wilderness of IBM that was already doing that. So we didn't want to interfere with that. So then we went back and looked again. IBM was organized by industry in those days, and the distribution industry is where we went. And uh, I worked with a gentleman who was the head of the distribution industry. So all the sales and marketing organizations of IBM were industry oriented. So the distribution industry salespeople who sold computers to the Macy's and the uh, all of those types of companies, uh, the Safeways and so on, brokers that were in the distribution industry, uh, all those salespeople reported up to him and he knew what they needed and required. And so they had well documented uh, the need for uh, increased speed at point of sale. Uh, inventory management and control reordering and uh, better decisions on how to sell stuff from the store, where to position it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we worked with the head of the distribution industry. By the way, that was a guy named John Akers, who also later became CEO and president of IBM. <laughs> and so it was kind of interesting. There were three presidents of IBM, the current one and two others that were four or five of the important people in this program. Anyway. Uh, so um, I pulled together this uh, proposal for uh, starting up a new business in uh, retail and supermarket industries. And we also included in that everything from hotel motel, which we regarded as a distribution thing. You know, you go around, you travel, you stay in a hotel, uh, fast foods, uh, 7-Eleven stores, uh, gas stations, all of that. But we decided to start with retail and supermarket, big retail and supermarket. And so uh, down the road we went and I put together a proposal uh, treating IBM executives just as though they were venture capitalists and uh, put a proposition in front of them for money and everything. And uh, they bought it 
and, and off we started. And so that's when the real team development started. So then I was asked, uh, well, I wasn't asked, uh, I, I had to get going. And uh, I had been told that they'd prefer to do this business in North Carolina, even though I was in California, because the North Carolina uh, facility had been started only uh, four years earlier in 1965, and uh, the factory was uh, just being completed and was certainly far from full. And so they wanted to bring new products there to develop. You being a manufacturing guy, I would appreciate yeah. that. And so uh, I moved to North Carolina, and uh, upon arriving there, it, it was a typical situation for IBM uh, development manufacturing situation. That is to say, they have a development laboratory, usually in the same location as their major manufacturing plants. And the manufacturing plants typically manufacture, there are exceptions, but they typically manufacture the products that are developed by the laboratory. The laboratory, about 1,000 people at that time, and the uh, manufacturing facility, 7,000. And uh, it would grow later, of course. Both of them would grow. Anyway, uh, I went there and uh, I could see, you know, what the products were going to be. I mean, we were going after a point of sale. We had described this to the executives and they bought it. So we knew we had to do scanning. Uh, we had to come up with some kind of a symbol to be scanned. As yet, uh, the symbol selection committee of the universal uh, that, that eventually decided on the universal product code from the supermarket institute hadn't even been formed yet. Yes, yeah. this was 1969. They were formed in 70, and then they articulated what they wanted in 71 and picked the uh, picked the the one that they would use, which happened to be ours in 1973, 50 years ago this year. So anyway. Uh, we, uh, I, I went to Raleigh and I looked around at the engineers and I picked the ones that I thought would be, uh, the best at developing, uh, codes and scanners and communications. We needed a different communications that would work effectively, but with inexpensive wires, like in telephone lines that already existed between the point of sale point and back at the main store. In, uh, in in retail, for example, some of the stores, one of them in the United States had a thousand cash registers in it, Macy's in New York. and uh, But supermarkets also uh, had to have communications from the front end to the back room. And so I needed communications people. And then uh, we had to put demands on the uh, controller. It, it couldn't fail. So we had to have a duplexed controller because there was no price on the item. You couldn't check out. People, if you didn't have, I mean, if you lost your controller because there were no, no longer prices on the items. And and, uh, and then we had to have all new uh, magnetic uh, storage device because uh, the existing ones weren't fast enough for the amount of data that we had to ship back and forth between the check stand and the uh and, and the back room and from the back room uh, to the warehouse and so on. So all of those things were new. So I tried to pick people that had the talent uh, and the systems understanding to try to pull all that together. And I started off with uh, six guys plus myself. Uh, we went that way for a period of time and then added more. In a couple of years, uh, several years, we were up to a couple of hundred people, a lot of whom were doing special uh, software programming for the way the different uh, chains wanted their operation to be managed. But nevertheless, that's how we pulled them together. And I was just fortunate that IBM had really talented people that some of them were older and had experience and had uh, had, had uh, patent history that was uh, exciting. Uh, others were younger and uh, fresh with new ideas out of school. They all worked very well together. Interesting, because I think one of the things that you, when you hear about barcode, you know, there's been, you know, I've heard that there's like one inventor of of this technology. But the truth of the matter is, as you just described, it was a team effort. So you, this was an arms race, right? So you knew yeah. that that it was a technology race to who would have the right technology by the time they selected, a, a, a you know, the, the, the barcode and, and the reading technology. And so you guys were in a bit of a race. So um, that, that's right. You know, yeah. just to comment on what you brought up there, because there is a lot of misunderstanding. If you go on the Internet and you look around, you'll see uh, the claims that somebody invented the UPC. And in fact, they specifically talk about Joe Woodland, who was a member of my team. Yeah. Uh, and he did invent a code that could be scanned, but it wasn't the UPC. It didn't work very well. 
And uh, he invented it back in 1948 and didn't really have a chance to make anything of it because there were there's no good scanning technology at that time. Light sources didn't exist. He didn't have the wherewithal to pull together a system around it either. And uh, the code did not work very well. It had a big high failure rates. I got a call uh, back in 1970 from Joe Woodland, who by that time, coincidentally, not related to me, but coincidentally, happened to be working for IBM. He had moved yeah. around from one company to another. 20 some years had passed since he invented his code. Uh, the, the the bullseye code, as it's called. And uh, he said, hey, Paul, he said, uh, I, I'm working here in the laboratory at IBM in upstate New York. Uh, it's cold up here uh, <laughs> down in North Carolina. Uh, and uh, I have studied the code that you and your team have come up with. And I think it's absolutely outstanding. It's far better than mine. And I would like to come down and join your team. I'm excited about the supermarket industry and supermarket applications. And he had very well defined that in his early years, better than anybody else. And uh, so uh, I thought, what could you do better than to hire the guy who invented one of the codes you're competing with uh, to be on your team and to tell everybody that yours is better? So I hired him. He came down. He did a great job. I gave him awards and so on. The confusion comes because... About 15 years later, George Bush was walking through a supermarket uh, setup. It wasn't yes. a real supermarket, but a yes. supermarket setup at a convention in Florida. And uh, he saw the scanner for the first time. And he thought, gee, this will help me against Clinton because he was not looking good in the polls. And uh, so he thought he'll get pictures taken. It looks like he's in a supermarket and scanning and all that kind of stuff. But it backfired on him, and the famous author that wrote about it said, uh, you know, Bush amazed at supermarket technology, which every housewife knows, you know, blah, blah, blah. But Bush did tell his team, find out who invented this and give him the, the Presidential Medal of Technology for the best invention I've ever seen. And so they called IBM. No, but they didn't call IBM. They, they, they asked the team that had shown him this, who were supermarket people, they said, we don't know who invented it, somebody at IBM. And so they called the Universal Product Code Council, which at the time was the organization that handed out the numbers for the code. And they said, well, we have the original proposal from IBM. Well, as I pointed out earlier, I asked Joe to write that proposal. Right. He didn't author it, but on the back cover or the front cover, it said, uh, inside the front cover, I guess it said, if you have any questions about any of this stuff. And this was the book that told other companies how to build a product that could scan it because we were required to do that since our code have been the one selected. And so it had Joe Woodland's name and phone number. So Bush's people called him up. I don't know what conversation went on, but shortly thereafter, he was given the Congress to the uh, Presidential Medal of Technology. And so everybody said he invented the thing. Well, he did invent the code. And by the way, nobody invented our code because by the time the Supermarket Institute decided they wanted a code, they said it had to be in the public domain. We don't want to make anybody the richest person in the world and so on. So we were told not to file any patents. So I told all my team members not to file any patents on it. And Joe's patent was the only one that was okay. And it was okay only because it was more than 17 years old. And so it no longer was uh, applicable. And uh, so anyway, so that's the reason for all that misunderstanding. So Joe was a member of the team, but not at engineering member. He was a marketing member of the team, and, and he did a great job at that. But he did not invent the universal product code or the barcode. He had his circular code, which I'm afraid if it had been the only code we had, it would have failed because it had a very high error rate. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. As a leader, you're responsible for the mission and the people assigned to you. Regardless of the size of your team, employees are depending on you for their lives and careers. For the sake of your team and the people who entrust you with this role, you need to master the skills to become a great leader. Best-selling leadership author John Rennie is proud to introduce the Qualified Leadership Book Series. This new series teaches you how to become a people-centered leader. Great leaders know that employees who are respected, appreciated, and allowed to grow will go the extra mile. These books provide real-world leadership wisdom written from a hands-on perspective. If you want to be a more effective leader, this is the one book series you should read this year. This three-book series contains the following best-selling leadership books. I Have the Watch, You Have the Watch, and All in the Same Boat for one low price of $39.99. 
Begin your journey to become a leader worth following. Go to johnsrenny.com and get your order in today. This episode is brought to you by Habit Stack. Effective leaders make a habit of working on important goals no matter how busy they feel. Habit Stack software helps leadership teams build that habit. The system guides you to set crystal clear goals, align your tasks to those goals, and make progress every week. I use Habit Stack and I absolutely love it. It's such an easy tool to use, and I love how it reinforces the right habits with my leadership team. Habit Stack is free to use. It's so simple that you get the hang of it in just five minutes. Go to habitstack.com to get started. This episode is brought to you by Ignite Management Services. Ignite is led by Mike Watson, who you might remember from episode 137. Mike and his team believe that everything starts with leadership, whether it's strategy execution or cultural transformation. It's the role of the leader to create the conditions for their people to succeed. The team at Ignite can help you develop critical habits to enhance your leadership capability and transform your business. Ignite Management is now offering the Resilient Leadership Assessment Tool, This is an online questionnaire designed to assess and guide leadership development, coaching, and team building. It provides leaders an opportunity to gain insights into their leadership strengths and development needs. After taking this assessment, you will receive a custom detailed report that provides practical and actionable recommendations to enhance your effectiveness. I have taken this assessment myself and found it to be extremely valuable in helping me make changes to my leadership approach. Right now, Ignite is offering 15% off the price of this tool to the deep leadership audience. Go to ignitemanagement.ca and enter the code START15 at checkout to get started today. This episode is brought to you by Jeremy Clevenger at Liberty Strength. As a high-performing leader, you know that leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about leading by example. And for most people, the one area that they are lacking when it comes to leading by example is their health and fitness. By improving your health and fitness, every other area of your life improves. Your energy skyrockets, your sleep improves, your confidence increases, and more. But how can you get and stay fit as a busy leader? Well, you do what you've always done. You hire the best people for the job. Don't struggle on your own. Put liberty strength in your corner. Jeremy and his team will work with you to take your physique, mindset, nutritional habits, and more to the next level with his step-by-step, all-inclusive coaching program. I've worked with Liberty Strength for the past two years, and I'm in the best shape of my life, and I'm still hitting strength personal records at 56 years old. If you want to step up your game, reach out to Jeremy at libertystrengthtx.com to find out more and get your initial consultation scheduled with him today. It's interesting because you're hearing you talk about it because I've been involved with with some major R&D projects where, it, in fact, I got a patent on one of the ideas uh, on this, but it was a major project, it was a team effort, and we did things that we did something that was never done before, and the company got a lot of accolades, but there were a few of us that were sort of inventors on it. But but it's always was a was always a team effort. In other words, it was right. us together as a team accomplishing a goal. Yeah. One of the things I was going to ask you about that, so. Um, you know, as what can we tell like the the listeners uh, that are listening in that are, that may be leaders that might be project managers? How do you we how do we build? I mean, obviously recruitment was a big part of this, but how do you build and motivate a team to 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 do something that's never been done before? To do the impossible? I think this is I think that's what's remarkable about the story is the technology was just barely getting there. Like laser technology was there, scanning was there, the computers were just enough. I mean, everything was right on the ragged edge of being available at that time. And you put it all together and, 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 yeah. and won the day. I think that's a major story. Yeah. It, you're right. There were many technologies that were on the ragged edge. Yeah. My opportunity was that I either, I knew one of the edges. My edge was scanning. Uh, but the others, I, I wasn't the, the expert at, but I had bumped into them. In my nine years at IBM before, I had worked with the people that, developed uh, Winchester technology for file recording, magnetic recording. We put uh, stripes on credit cards the first time they were put on. We put we built the barrier rapid transit uh, magnetic stripe on a ticket. And we, you know, we used the code in magnetic form for the retail in the first 25, 30 years. 
And uh, I was uh, familiar with scanning bars. So I picked uh, George Lauer to lead the code team. And uh, he had uh, three or four people that were really instrumental in helping. He came up with some of the ideas. Uh, uh, we we uh, had ideas about uh, how to make the code more reliable than Joe Woodland's old code. And there was a different guy that came up with that. So the real key items of the symbol were like four different guys. But we did have an expert uh, in each of the fields we needed. We had two experts in communications. Uh, we had experts in communications that knew a lot about error detection and error correction, including George Flower. And uh, so that was uh, satisfied. Uh, I had made friends with people when I was uh, back at uh, IBM in San Jose who were experts in magnetics. We didn't have one locally. We, we were good enough to be able to build wands to scan magnetically, but not the whole file system. And so I was able, you know, one of the lessons is don't burn your bridges because uh, I called up a lot of people in a lot of different labs in different continents and said, you know, I've got this problem. Can you help me? And they all said yes. And uh, so I was traveling a lot in those days. Uh, we had the magnetics developed in Hursley, England. We designed the scanner, but had it built in Rochester, Minnesota. We had to have the computer uh, in the back room, uh, specially designed for uh fail-safe, you know, uh, characteristics uh, in San Jose, California. And we did most of the rest of it in Raleigh. So so we did have somebody connected with us or on the end of the phone that was an expert in each of the different technologies. And I had several really good systems people. And systems people are really what you require to put this kind of a package together because they understand what needs to be done and how the system needs to work. And you can define that. And so I think uh, in answer to a question you asked a little while ago is uh, how do you keep the team motivated to go at all of this? And the answer is you have some meetings, you know, not every day, but maybe every week or every other week where you call the people together and you talk to them. You know, it's not like they're making a report to senior management. They're reporting to each other. You know, we need this link and we need that link and we need this thing and we need that thing. And here's how I'm coming on that. And sometimes somebody who doesn't even have expertise in the area that the guy who is explaining his problem has <laughs> comes up with an idea to, well, try something like this, you know, and they do. And so the, the people that were working on the symbol met with the people who were working on the, the magnetics and met with the people who were working on the communications and other people who were working on the, the, the point of sale device itself, you know, which in fact was in a way, you could call it the first PC because it had everything a PC had. It had yeah, a, yeah. a stored program computer that we could program. It had a memory. Uh, it had a keyboard. It had a display. And, uh, you know, it had a scanner attached. And uh, and we put the first integrated circuits that were ever done in IBM into that point of sale terminal. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that was 10 years before the PC. So um, th that's the way that worked. We, we everybody, uh, you know, got together and talked about these things and, and we had regular meetings about it. And then they would go off and work in their own rooms and, and, and they were free to call up other people. And uh, some of them, uh, like George Lauer, as I said, he was my lead guy on the symbol itself. But he had four or five helpers, each one of which came up with one of the real key elements and uh, so, as I say in the book, if we had written a patent on it, I think there would be four or five names on the patent, and uh, deservedly so. Yeah, it's one, what's interesting to me is that, like I said, you know, we're you're doing something that's never been done before, and um, you know, did I guess what I'm what I, did did you know? It, did everybody know what the date was? Like we had to have a working solution by a certain date. Uh, was everybody working towards, you know, a, a common, like, we have to have a working solution by a certain time. So there was like a clock running the whole time, or was it? Yeah, was yeah, it, there, there was. Over but, but, you know, it was the standard clock of development. I had so much money, and we were going to run out, and then I had to get more. <laughs> yes. you know, I mean, <laughs> okay. When I first asked for the money, I, I, I asked for $300,000 the first year, a million dollars the second year, and $3 million the third year. And an interesting story that bears that out. This is the kind of pressure we had. Uh, 
I was uh, working in the laboratory and laying out a scanner. And we got a new division president. Uh, the, the first division president, uh, it was replaced. Uh, he went up the line and we got a new one. And the new guy comes to town. He was a very famous guy. His name was Bob Evans. And uh, so he came in and, and we showed him what we were going to do. We were going to grab this uh, item and move it at 100 inches a second up to six inches off of the tabletop while it might be spinning and read the label on it and uh, send it off to the check stand and do all the work that had to be done there and increment the inventory and send it back and so on before the customer could tell. And we were going to do that with 40 check stands at the front end, which was required in some of the stores in Europe. And, uh, before the customer could tell. And he said, you know what, this is the most ridiculous, you know, blankety blank program I've ever heard of. Uh, and, uh, I know damn well that if, uh, if if I let you continue on this today and I came down and checked it out on a regular basis, I would kill it uh, in no time. So, uh, but you guys have a good reputation. And uh, so uh, I'm going to go away for one year and I'm coming back in one year. And if this damn thing doesn't work, McEnroe, your name, I mean, your desk is going to be in the parking lot. <laughs> and out the door he walked. So, I mean, you know, we're thinking of my desk in the parking lot, meaning that you're fired. They right, right. They didn't really fire you in IBM. They wouldn't have fired me. What they would have done is uh, you're out of this job and, you know, they'd move me to some hallway at the yeah. end of the hall and I'd have no secretary and, or assistant or, or anything and nobody would dial my phone for six months and then they'd give me a new job. Right. Anyway, that's what happened to you <laughs> in those days. So, um, he came back in one year, to the day, to the very day. And he was a busy guy. And he walked in the lab and he picked up a pack of cigarettes that we had stuck a label on that we had hand printed. These hand printed labels were hard to scan. That that's where the difficulty of reliability. I, I understand that. Yeah, that was the a scanner yeah. would be a problem. And so he picked that up and he threw it across the check stand and it 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 bounced around and slid across and it read it correctly. And, you know, he said some unmentionable thing. And then he got down on his hands and knees. And by the way, he was like 275 pounds. He was a very big man. He got down on his hands and knees and opened the doors up underneath the scanner like he was expecting to find some small fellow under there keying <laughs> numbers in a <laughs> thing based on what he knew they were going to scan. Uh, and, uh, of course, he didn't find the gentleman under there. And... Uh, you know, he walked out in the parking lot and bought us back a prize. Actually, the prize he bought us were three bottles of Jack Daniels, which uh, we would all have been fired for having if we <laughs> <laughs> if I ever caught us with. But whatever. So that was kind of the urgency of it. We 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 knew we had to get it done and had to get it done in that time frame. And of course, once we were selected as the international standard, then there was a time frame, you know. And by the way, we didn't win it. Uh, you know, NCR beat us to the punch. Uh, NCR, uh, I had seen them as an opportune target because they had 95% of the marketplace. And by the way, they had had that kind of market hit for almost 100 years. You know, they started in the 1870s, 1880s, and uh, they were worldwide. But they had this big old cash uh, registered that was uh, a very, very heavy and not very convertible. You know, it was cast iron and big levers and keys and everything. And they, uh, you can see, hey, all we got to do is beat that thing and we've got a market outlined for us. But we knew we had to do it. And so NCR, uh, they had proposed a green, black, and white code that was rejected. And uh, they weren't even a finalist. They were uh, rejected early on. And then they adopted our code and, and uh, supported us in the selection process. And then, of course, I remember I told you about I have Woodland write the instructions. So we published the instructions immediately after we were selected for other companies to read. And NCR got the instructions and they had their reader working before ours. Why? Because IBM was under uh, Justice Department. Uh, supervision, we had to be very certain that we did not announce anything until we had tested it six ways from Sunday. And we didn't sell anything until we had tested it even more. So we had all kinds of tests going on and being conducted around uh, different in, in, in the United States and outside the United States. And uh, so we were a month or so behind NCR. That's why you've heard that the first scanner was uh, at NCR 
uh, installed store in a Kroger supermarket or in a supermarket rather in uh, in Ohio near, yeah. near their facility. Interesting. So um, one of the things I was thinking about is, is, you know, younger people that might be listening into this, con- this discussion and they might be thinking, wow, what, you know, this was an amazing story. This is, this is a 50 year technology. But one of the things is, is you were working on something to improve conditions and to make things better. So you were, you were, you were basically improving operations inside retail and supermarket spaces, right? One of the things that a lot of people are chasing money today versus, you know, ways to improve things. And do you have any advice for, for younger generations who might be working on inventions or new technology or something and, and what they should be focused on versus, you know, maybe chasing the dollar, but more chasing what's really important for society? I've seen a lot of uh, people chase the dollar and I haven't seen a lot of success. I, <laughs> I've, I've known a lot of people that did have a lot of success but they were really chasing a passion or uh, their interest, or uh, they, they had a company that uh, had uh, some ideas about some products and they really grew. Uh, and, and, and they filled in uh, those uh, product ideas. But uh, if you're just walking around thinking, what can I invent that will make me rich? Uh, I think uh, you're, not, you're not so likely to succeed. I think what you need to do uh, is to uh look at what your interests are and uh if you if, if you don't have any specific interest or if your interest is not something that is likely to uh take you where you want to go and have the opportunities you want then you can sort of step back and look at the world look at look at systems in the world and see what things are missing and see what you might be able to provide and if you work for a company see what kind of technologies that company has that might fit in to some of those bigger systems and uh, cause that to become a bigger success. So you can grow a, a, an opportunity or you can create a new opportunity and uh, it, it incorporate the teamwork. Don't try to do everything. Just uh, try to do uh, understand the system that you're working with and see what you can do to help contribute it to get started. And then uh, call on other people, friends and uh, whoever you might need to call on to uh, contribute something to what you're trying to do because a team can do a lot more than an individual. Nah, that's such, such a great advice. What, what do you feel when you go, I mean, when you're in a supermarket or you're, you know, like everything in my cabinets, every, every, even in our factory, we run everything on UPC codes, just to that, or, or two, we, we use barcodes for scanning and tracking yeah. all, like the life cycle of our products and what have you. But what do you, what do you think when you see these, you know, for 50 years later, you're, you open up your cabinet and you get some Ritz crackers out and there's the barcode sitting in there. Just, yeah. What does that make you I'm, feel? I'm kind of like everybody else, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I do uh, the shopping for the family and, uh, it's just my wife and I at home now, and uh, I love to go to the supermarket. And uh, I've introduced myself to the to the manager of my local supermarket. He's called up the head of the Albertson <laughs> stores in Southern California and had them come up. All the check stand operators know me; they have a great deal. I love I it. Personally, I personally have the patent on the uh, uh, the pistol grip uh, scanner that you point at items in the cart. Uh, yeah. I got that patent myself uh, in the program back in 1971, two years before we even came up, uh, and uh, 72 maybe it was. But anyway, um, so all the check stand operators, they all know me by my name. I know them by their name. I love it. I love we it. We have a chat all the time, and uh, we, we have a good old time. That's, that's So I just kind of look at it uh, as everything else. Uh, I, I, I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time and uh, have the right people. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it. nobody got rich on the barcode, like I say. A lot of people think that I'm rich as sin, but, uh, you know, I'm not. I mean, I just got a good salary and a good promotions and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, they, they. I think it was very wise for the Supermarket Institute to say, that, uh, you know, uh, we're not going to make anybody, uh, you know, a, a billionaire or uh, on, uh, you know, because of the code. And uh, I think that's paid off because, uh, you know, if it had, you know, that other people which would be trying to create other codes and so on and so forth, we'd have 50 million codes and and they'd all be different and therefore it wouldn't work. I mean, the reason it works is it's the same. It's the same in India as it is in China, as it is in the United States and Australia. 
Uh, so, uh, and I think the fact that uh, it's not patented and there's no proprietary rights to it and nobody's getting any uh, royalties for it, all of that uh, contributes to its ubiquity. Wow, I love it. That's such a great uh, story, such a great message. There's so many elements in there, leaders who are listening in, so many elements to to Paul's story with the, the, the recruitment, the motivation, the overcoming adversity, the challenges, the like your career is on the line, right? Uh, you're, you're, you're trying to outpace the competitors. There's, there's opportunities for collaboration, uh, networking. All these things were critical to developing this technology. And these are critical skills for leaders. So and there's one, one other thing that we, sh- we sure. should mention, uh, we don't have time to go into it, but you know, the public uh, acceptance was, uh, you know, I mean, particularly political acceptance was very poor. 18 states passed laws yeah. against it. Uh, yeah. My first store wouldn't open because the picket lines uh, from the union said they were afraid they were going to lose checkout uh, operators. And uh, the laser scanner, they were where there was worry that it would ruin everybody's eyesight. I had to yeah. uh, send to Africa by monkeys and have them tested uh, to be sure that, you know, there wouldn't be accumulation of laser light in the eye and cause problems. So we had a lot. And, and you know, the big concern that everybody had was, oh, price is not going to be on the item anymore. Yeah. So, gee whiz, how are you going to live without prices on the item? Yeah. The, the answer was is that the detailed check slip that had the, the information next to the price that said how much you paid for it was better for comparison shopping than it was before. Yeah, and I understand even even the manufacturers were hesitant to say to put that UPC label on their product because if they have a beautiful package design, they don't want to. Ruin That's right. It. They, they yeah. were worried about the space, and uh, yeah. one of the the space consideration was one of the very largest problems uh, in yeah. the early days of the code because it was easy to make a code that was too big. <laughs> you, you know, then you could scan it very easily, but we had to scan it and make it smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. And, uh, and I understand that was a big challenge. I understand a pack of gum was the first thing scanned, or was a pack of ten. No, the gum is what it was. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it was a smaller barcode that had to pass the, or at least was the first thing. Yeah. Well, it's a yeah, it's a fractional. You know, we when we did the standard barcode had two sides to it. You know, and if you look at the bars, they're separated in the middle by some other bars. Mm-hmm. There's a whole story behind that. But uh, anyway. Uh, it is five digits on the left and five on the right. They can go up to six now on each side and so on. And then there's a country code buried in some of the bars. But uh, basically uh, on the gum and the real small packages like that, we had different options. So you could use only half a code. And that's what uh, that's what that was. Ah, oh, man, this is such a great story. Listeners, I hope you are enjoying this conversation as much as I am. And if you want to dig deeper in this, this this is a book that you're going to want to get, especially if you're like me, you love technology, love stories of of, of teams overcoming impossible hurdles. Uh, I encourage you to pick up this book. It's called The Barcode, How a Team Created One of the World's Most Ubiquitous Technologies. Paul, uh, how can people find out more about you and this book? Oh, they, you can buy the book on Amazon, and I'm sure it goes down the line and goes to you based on its barcode. It's got one on the front <laughs> and uh, one that counts on the back, uh, and uh, it's available on Barnes and Noble, and uh, it will be available at, at stores and so on. And uh, yeah, that 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 works out fine. Oh, uh, that's great. We're, and and listeners, there's a link in the show notes for the book. I encourage you to get it. If you're anything like me, you're going to love this story. You're going to love the story of how they overcame all this adversity to create a technology that's still used today, and it's going nowhere. As far as I'm concerned, that technology will probably be around for 15 more years. So, Paul, I want to thank you for coming on the, sh- uh, the show and sharing the story uh, of how you you and your team developed this technology uh, that still exists today. So thanks for coming on the show. It is my pleasure. Thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. 
For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Step inside the marketing mirror to uncover marketing secrets, discover gems, tactics, lessons, and campaigns you can use, next gen or fundamentals. Grab the marketing magic to improve your marketing and win more business. Electric Acid. Welcome to the Reverie Channel, where entertainment knows no bounds. Live concerts, on-demand music, documentaries, and short films, all in stunning HD. Now on Roku TV, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire, immerse yourself from home. And on Android and iOS for those on the move. Support creators with crowdfunding donations. Fuel their creativity. Join us in shaping entertainment's future. The Reverie Channel, where every view, every donation matters.